we want to be the best. So we have to think about the outcomes and we prioritize the outcomes that are most important to serving our customers. And that's what we focus on. And that's how we prioritize. So when we think about it, there are core foundational capabilities we're working on. And in parallel, we think about our customers. In honor of Salesforce World Tour New York, we're celebrating Fins Week here at ITV. We're gonna be rebroadcasting some of our favorite financial service industry guests, starting with this conversation with Stacey Goodman, EVP and CIO of Prudential. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Stacey explains her areas of focus concerning digitization of services at Prudential. She also details her own priorities in those of Prudential's customers, and she also chats a lot about her career journey. Enjoy this episode. IT Visionaries is brought to you by Salesforce Platform. Did you know? Salesforce has its own streaming platform called Salesforce Plus. Now you can watch Legends of Low Code. In this series, three teams of trailblazers race to build the best low code app to help charities. Check it out. Nine trailblazers have answered the call to build the best app for a nonprofit in only two days. This is a powerhouse crew here. I hope everybody brings it. This is Legends of Low Code. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have a special guest. She is the EVP and Chief Information Officer at a small little company called Prudential Financial. <laughs> Stacy Goodman, welcome to the show. Thanks, Albert. Uh, it's good to be here. Yes, a very, very small company, Prudential. <laughs> yes, we looked it up on LinkedIn, surprisingly to us. No, I'm just kidding. Prudential is a massive company. I think most of us have seen your commercials for sure. Uh, we looked it up on LinkedIn. It's over 26,000 employees. But for those listening, if you're not familiar with Prudential Financial, Stacy, can you tell our audience what it is you guys do? And before I do, I want to know if you saw our most recent commercial. Well, I don't know. Which one is it? Oh, uh, Well, you've probably seen our PGM investment one, but our most recent one is talking about Who's Your Rock. You should watch it. It's awesome. All right. I'm going to go check it out. Who's Your Rock? Make note of that. We'll probably link it in the show notes below. All right. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about Prudential. So we're a 145-year-old company, and we started with life insurance. In fact, today, uh, we are global in over 40 countries, and we are still a leader in life insurance. But now we are one of the largest asset managers, which most people don't know. And we have about one and a half trillion in assets under management. And if you put that in perspective, we are probably the 13th largest GDP in the world. And so as the CIO of a company like Prudential, um, it's a lot of fun to be part of something so special. Yeah. Listen, for those of you guys that just didn't hear her, say that number again. How many assets under management? One and a half trillion. One and a half trillion. I want to say a small percentage of that is mine. Uh, <laughs> it's a very small percentage. <laughs> you, Prudential, I am a Prudential customer. Uh, so I'm really excited to have you on the show. You know, one of the things that we've learned over the years at IT Visionaries um, or over the seasons is one of the biggest, hardest things to do is to modernize, digitally transform massive companies. But you guys are in a different boat too, because you have the extra layer, which is you're in the finance game or the FINRA game, uh, heavily regulated industry, which makes it a little bit more challenging what you guys are going through. Talk about what you're attempting to do there at Prudential to up-level that customer experience. Because as we know, every company is going through some transformation of some sort. I think finance financial companies are probably lifting it a little bit harder right now. Um, but give us an idea of what the company is going through, given the way the market's continue to move and modernize and people want better, faster experiences. You know, I'm sure all these things you guys talk about just about every meeting. You know, it's, it's, um, there's so much going on. Um, and I, I, I don't even know where to start, but let me, let me talk about just the, the change. You know, when I started, uh, we actually have an application that was built in 1968. Okay. Now that's before the, the man stepped on the moon. <laughs> uh, you know that that's that's uh, it's pretty a wild uh, stat there. So we we are definitely on a journey to modernize our environment significantly, and we're taking multiple tacks on that. Um, Albert, at first, is to just build some foundational tech capabilities, which include both the what and the how. So, you know, one, what are we trying to solve for, which is improving the customer experience, uh, you know, really helping our customers 
improving the experience for our employees as well. But when we think about um, you know, tech transformation, it's also about the how. We're thinking about expanding agile techniques and processes more broadly, how we deliver core technology services, how we deliver to the customer so that we can test and learn because we really want to improve the customer experience. So we're doing a lot more around design thinking and using those techniques to better the experience for a customer. And just to give you an idea, you know, uh, how much better it is, we have just built with the help of Salesforce uh, online self-service, which we couldn't do before. You, you couldn't change your beneficiary before calling into a contact center. And now through S Salesforce platform and just our own development, we've been able to sort of automate a lot of capabilities and provide kind of a better experience. We're also doing things like data science uh, techniques, which we did some of, but we're really putting it what I call on steroids. So things that used to take you know, days to do like underwriting now take seconds. Um, and so we're getting better at kind of building foundational capabilities, changing the way we work so we can deliver faster, smarter, and a much better customer experience. There's a lot going on, but if you think about Prudential, just like any major company, we have a lot of a lot of technology that was built in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and we have to manage that while we're starting to improve. And if I may, Albert, um, we're also focused on innovation and really differentiating as well, because we look at technology as a as a game changer. You know, one of our aspirational goals is to be tech forward. So that was a lot there, but I wanted to share that with you. No, I mean, I know what you're saying because, so I, I, I mentioned in our pre-call, but for our audience that wasn't there, that I'm a Prudential customer, that my very first job used Prudential Retirement Investing so that I could put money away. And of course, they would manage my portfolio for me. I got to pick a couple of different funds and, and so on. So that's how I got into Prudential side. But you hit on a really great point in regards to how you have to modernize with the customer because finance is one of those industries where once you have your money there, like I'm telling you, it's been there since 2006. I've not moved the money to another uh, servicer. And when I go, let's say, open new accounts or get new opportunities from different jobs, like you typically they open an account, like all of a sudden I'm access to Vanguard, all of a sudden I'm access to Fidelity. You know, those are obviously competitors. But, you know, it's one of those industries where people like winning a customer is so important because the customer probably is not going to move. Talk, well, talk about that, like drive, like, cause that's an interesting factor to, to, you know, make sure you modernize that experience to get that next wave. Well, obviously we, we definitely, the experience is, is the differentiator, right? You want yeah. to experience. So you, you say your money's been here since 2006. I don't know about you, but I like to go on and check that my money's there almost. I check it every day. month, <laughs> every month. <laughs> you go month, I may go daily, uh, but, <laughs> but, but kidding aside, you know, you're at the point where, you not only want to check it often, but you want to check it from anywhere. And right. so, you know, things happen along the way. That experience has to be good. How many times do you forget your password? Um, and I got to tell you, I forget mine all the time because I'm constantly yeah. changing them. As Because obviously having responsibility for info security, we think about, you know, putting the proper controls in place. And I personally change all of my passwords often. So now... All of a sudden, you know, I'm somewhere, I have my phone, I need to check something. And the first thing I, I do is uh, mess up my password. So like that experience to be able to reset your, your password, uh, be able to look at your kind of balance every day uh, from wherever you are is really important. I, I think that retains a customer, um, that experience, just those little things. Certainly the simplicity of accessing the information that you, you know, that is yours. That certainly makes it easy. You know, we you know we checked it out on LinkedIn. It looks like you started this role in 2019. When you you know when you first got to Prudential, and you you know that's something that new executives often talk about. It's like you know you got to lift up the hood. You got to almost take inventory of yeah. what you got. You're mentioning that you're sitting on an application from 1968 potentially that you know you have to modernize. Talk about what did you see? What did you see as the opportunity? How did you react when you first sat down? Like, were you scared? Were you excited? Like, give us an idea. Oh, I, I was excited. I mean, look, Prudential is a great company, Albert. Uh, it is a, a fantastic company, high integrity. So the opportunity to help them, 
you know, when, when I came in, but now help us, I shouldn't say them, us, the opportunity to help us change the experience and the perception from being a, you know, a rock and a solid stable company where you keep money to also being a great customer experience is just really exciting. So how could you not want to join and be part of that process, right? So to me, to be part of something so game-changing and transformational uh, is, is exciting. How did you yourself think about prioritization? Because with a company of that size, obviously, custom built applications, vendor applications, like you got everything, right? You got, you got vendor tools, you got custom built tools, you got integrated tools, you have tools that need to be integrated. Like I'm sure there was a lot of requests, let's say of you in the first 90 days. How did you go about prioritization? What did you think about in regards to like, hey, what, what do we tackle first? Well, you know, you have to have multiple threads going. First, we have to look at the core platforms. You need to have the capabilities in order to change. So I mentioned agile, but you also need a modern infrastructure, right? How, how do you get more to market fast if you don't have kind of DevOps capabilities, the ability to kind of test and learn quickly, right? So we can work in an agile way, but you need all of the technology tools to do that fast. So that's kind of one thread we definitely were going to focus on. And we've done a lot of work in that space. The other and the primary reason is we are a business. We're not, we, we, I want to be a technology company one day. I think we'll get there. But I think what we want to be is tech forward towards our business outcomes. And so since we are a business, we want to be uh, the best. So we have to think about the outcomes and we prioritize the outcomes that are most important to serving our customers. And that's what we focus on. And that's how we prioritize. So when we think about it, there are core foundational capabilities we're working on. And in parallel, we think about our customers. So Albert, tell me what you want me to focus on next. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I feel like my, as a customer, I'm always thinking about how do I get even bigger returns? So I guess uh, being able to access more funds, more product blends, maybe some automation investing. I think that's very popular right now where people like um, people like robo advisory tools to like do it for them a little bit. I'm um, right. sure crypt, crypt, cryptocurrency is probably beca- like when I think of the next wave of investor, like they're probably going to want a blend of, let's say, equities and possibly crypto. Um, I'm just naming <laughs> things off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> but those are things I think about. Like when I when I choose where to put my money, I want, even if I choose the most conservative blend possible, I think people like optionality. I think they like to know that they could be more aggressive if they wanted to, that they could, even if it was like, I think about when I put away money and th- there's like options to say like, Hey, 10% goes here, 10% goes here, 10% goes here. Like I can self-diversify. I'm just thinking about like, so it's like a lot of optionality and control is I guess the common theme between what I'm saying. Well, you know, that goes back to self-service. We want to give you capabilities. You can do a lot of things yourself, but ultimately we have a secret weapon, which are our advisors, right? We have a big advisory capability. So once you've played around a little bit and think about what you want to do, you can speak to an advisor who can help customize because the robo advisors are getting better, I won't say they're great. Um, but as as you're thinking matures, you may want a little advice along with the digital experience. So you definitely want to self serve. You want to see your money every day. You want to do oh, it yeah. everywhere. You want to be able to run scenarios in, in 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 like seeing what your balances will look like with this product or what it will look like in 20 years, etc. You may want to do all those cool things and get some advice, but ultimately we combine that whole continuum. And that's where our goal is not just to provide the digital, the digital with the advice is really where I think we can differentiate. Yeah, you know, that's interesting that you brought that up because that that is definitely something that we observed and we've talked with different CIOs, CTOs on this show as they talked about, hey, there's like this evolution over time where uh, let's say help, like you, we just said help. It was like you had a get in line into a call center. So that was a bad experience. Then there was the creation of knowledge bases. You can look it up yourself. But then what we started realizing is, well, especially like in the world of finance, I don't know what I'm reading. (laughs) So if I don't (laughs) know what I'm reading, how can I help myself? So then I had to get back in line or back in chat. So I think you definitely, for where you're, for especially where your company sits, it sits in a place where the reality is most people probably don't know. Like they, don't know enough, right? So they they do need some type of advisory. I don't think 
I don't think knowledge journals and articles are enough to get a customer, you know, into a good decision that they feel good, good about. Well, I think there's a spectrum. There are some people that are, are savvy and can do it themselves or need simpler products. But then there are folks as you, as you graduate or, you know, begin to have more complexity to what you need, the advice is there, which is different. But I will tell a funny story because you triggered something when I, I was uh, much younger. And we talked about this before we started. Uh, my father said the same thing, you know, put away a few bucks every year. You won't even notice it. And I did, but I also thought I could do my own taxes too. So one year, a couple of months before, right, knowledge base. I read all about doing my own taxes and the form looked pretty simple and I did it and I put it aside and about two days before they were due, I took out the real form and then filled in. And when I went to reconcile, the numbers didn't add up and I was pulling (laughs) my hair out. Thank God for my father and his accountant. So I filed an extension and then he did my taxes for me. So it goes back to the advice factor. It, it, It can look simple, but it does help to have that kind of guidance a little bit because you may not know how to do your taxes completely yourself, even if you read a book Um, and you may not be getting everything you need. So having that advice continuum is great. Um, And so that's kind of how I see it. No, that I 100% agree. And when you think about for yourself right now, what are some of like the technologies that you're really excited to bring bring into like the existing customer experience, or maybe it's the service experience. You know, it's one of those things where we always like hearing directly from the CIOs and CTOs themselves, like, hey, I'm really bullish on this. Uh, curiously for you, is it industries or implementation, ser- microservices, what are some of the things that you're really excited about possibly bringing to the, bringing to the business portfolio? Well, I I said some of the basic foundational stuff, like, you know, moving to the cloud, like building total native cloud-based applications and and moving to a full DevOps model, which I'm really excited about, which we we have underway. That's pretty cool uh, in, in my mind and building common microservices so that we can get speed to market and delivery of applications. But also, you know, and I'll use Salesforce as, a, as, a, as an example here is, you know, uh, you know, financial cloud. Um, the financial cloud's been great for us because we built a whole self-service experience, especially in our contact center where customers can do simple tasks and we're building upon that. And we're using some of the cool features like uh, biometrics that we like and some of the other analysis features that comes in, in financial cloud to help us. Uh, we think uh, heavily about data science as well and, and building um, capabilities around AI in particular, um, you know, sort of machine learning, uh, natural language processing like chatbots and stuff. So a whole host of things we're working on uh, that are very cool and exciting for us. Yeah, the future, it's, it's interesting from, so when I think of, because I think, I think more like probably just consumers, right? Where a lot of consumers are probably, there's kind of like, we kind of want things just done for us a little bit. You know, like I mentioned robo advisory and that usually starts, like you said, with the foundation in data science, machine learning, some type of, um, you know, artificial intelligence or programmatic algorithmic trading computations. Do you see that as like, um, do you see, is that like a big request among finance customers or are they more interested in, of course, everyone's interested in security, but I didn't know like where that weighs and like to people's priority. I'm guessing security is still number one. Like don't ever lose my money. <laughs> like, that's- well, well, security, <laughs> security is number one. You know, you, you, you know, Prudential's got um, high scores when it comes to being the rock and being very solid right. and highly high integrity kind of thing. Um, you know, but what people do want is they want a, um, uh, the ability to do things, simple things like, you yeah. know, be able to log in and check that their money is there, right? I mean, it sounds silly. That is security is just checking every day because in a volatile market, being able to do that or going online and, and making uh, requests. Um, you know, life insurance is different than other financial products, life insurance and annuities. And uh, that they want to be able to access the advisor. So they want both. It's a little different than what you describe in banking, where people go in into the the wealth management business and their financial advisor. 
we we really are more about uh, kind of a suite of products and we're built upon kind of the financial wellness side of it. So ensuring, you know, the customer's financial security. Um, it's a little different than maybe some of the other financial companies that you've, you've, you've spoken with. For anyone who's, let's say, thinking about, because some of our, so our listeners tend to blend um, on the career spectrum from very beginner, like software developers and engineers that are just starting to learn and start their careers to, you know, actual CIOs that are also operating, you know, right. big teams. You know, I don't know if any teams are as big as yours, but like they're operating big teams themselves. What are some of the consideration sets that are a lot different, I guess, in this industry, like in this industry or this product portfolio that maybe other companies don't think about, like, because that some of the concepts you mentioned, I think some software companies or tech people will be like, that sounds easy to do, but for you, for your industry, it's hard to do. Give us an idea of what you're facing, like what challenges and roadblocks that you guys have to, that you're in your team are constantly innovating um, out of. Uh, scale and complexity and, and are two that come to mind. Scale. I mean, if you think about the size of our, you know, assets or liability book, it's it's extremely large. And the complexity of products we have, I mean, people think about life insurance and they think about a simple product. We have quite a few products in around 145 years, although I don't think there's a 145-year-old policy. <laughs> <laughs> And if I and if we sold you that one, Albert, we definitely if someone sold you that, we need you to come over to Prudential. <laughs> <laughs> um, but kidding aside, um, if you you know if you think about the complexity of life insurance and annuities, it's different than banking products, right? Um, but if you go to a financial advisor, it's simple. It, it's probably similar to a, a, a Prudential advisor. We're trying to do what's best for you and your current uh, situation, whatever your needs are. So it's it's really about complexity and scale of insurance um, and annuities. It's a, it's a different animal. So one of the things that you certainly are, this problem is facing you, which is facing a lot of tech leaders today, is this idea around attracting talent. Attracting talent is one of the right. big major challenges. You know, for a lot of companies, a lot of, especially in the, the tech development world, whatever it may be, people like to go with like, they, like a lot of young engineers, they think they want to go to, Hey, fast moving, move fast, break things type companies. Um, you know, I don't know how many things you're allowed to break at potential. I'm assuming it's not that many, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, give us an idea of what like your, your industry potential, how you face, how you handle recruiting, because it is certainly the most coveted skill. Let's say web, you know, engineering talent is extremely coveted. Just about every company in the world is building a software layer that customers interact with. So you're fighting that superstar engineer. Hey, it's not just Prudential that wants them. It's every person in your industry and every person in every other industry that wants this person as well. Talk about how you guys are approaching recruiting and retention of talent. You know, you know, Albert, I, I think a little differently. I think this is the new frontier. Um, you know, it, take banking, for instance, it's been differentiated. It's been disrupted. There's every kind of startup or fintech and, and they're competing at, with the banks and the banks themselves have already built a lot of the technology, whether it's kind of go way back with simple ATM technology to now where, you know, you don't even have to go to the ATM if you don't want to, right? With, right. You know, Venmo, name it, PayPal, whatever, whatever you want to use, or even kind of um, Zelle, Bank of America. You you don't even have to kind of touch a branch in any way, and uh, you can do it all mobile. But insurance annuities, our industry has so much opportunity to really differentiate. So think about coming in and really testing your skills as an engineer. Can you solve? the challenges we have with the legacy infrastructure and help us differentiate. Uh, those are rare opportunities today. So we're, we're attracting a lot of talent because we also have an advantage like some of the bigger companies where we are committed to making the investment because we want a better customer experience. I also think that, you know, even though it's really hip and cool to go to some startup all the time and it feels like a great vibe, us ask some of uh, the folks out there in your next interview what it's like for them. When you come to Prudential, we have such a strong culture. Uh, you know, our, our employees are really important to, to us. 
So if you think about the culture, the investment and commitment to technology, and to be on the forefront of potentially being a differentiator and, and using technology to disrupt, uh, uh, that's, that's a lot of fun um, for people. So yes, it's corporate, it's not a startup, but I, I can't show you, but I am wearing jeans right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of in my comfort zone, right? I get a blend. So it's, it's fun. It's a fun environment. We're really changing everything and we're, we're investing. So it's just as much fun for an engineer to do engineering problems here as elsewhere. But you could be part of the future of helping uh, Prudential lead the way in being tech forward and disrupting the industry a bit. Hey, listen, I, I know exactly what you were just mentioning before. I've lived most of my career in the startup world where everything like, uh, yeah, it's not as glamorous as some of the, uh, some of the, you know, movie shows or TV shows or blogs make it out to be. It's definitely a big, big challenge. Podcasting, definitely not as, not as much pain, I would say, as engineering, uh, you know, the biggest challenge I always think about engineering is like, Hey, you have a hypothesis, you build it, but like, uh, is very possible it doesn't work and you got to go find that so it definitely takes a different type of person i i want to get an idea of how you know one of the things that you you have to do you mentioned earlier is like how secure like secure security is number one right how much i guess time energy goes into like checking qaing products before they go live to the customer because this might be a this might be shocking maybe to some of like our engineering audience members that like are used to like move fast, break things that they're willing to ship code into like the actual customer environment and it just broken and they just roll it back. Like, I don't think that's possible for Prudential. Like, I don't think you could do that. Well, I don't think anybody really does that. You know, even Salesforce, could you imagine if we're using a Salesforce pr product and they say, uh oh, we're going to roll out a new release in an hour. And then they call us back, you know, you know, the next day and say, oh, we got to give you a new release. Uh, <laughs> they don't. <laughs> they don't do it. So even if you're working for the Microsofts of the world or or the you know Amazons, whoever, what you're doing is you're you're testing your software pretty quickly, and you're using new modern techniques. I talked about DevOps, yeah. um, which allow you to kind of build the whole test capability into in, into the process itself, right? So. If you, if you think about how we develop software today and we implement those modern practices, uh, you're testing as you're going. And if something doesn't work, you can quickly change it. But generally, we're not going to push out something to the customer uh, without having some thorough testing. Um, you know, the concept of QA, you know, is something we want to be built into the process, not to be separate over time. And that's one Makes of sense. our ambitions if that makes sense. So yeah, it's pretty cool to be able to iterate through um, because when I first started working, you know, it could take weeks and weeks and I'm not talking about potential, uh, but, but, but years ago, you know, it take weeks and weeks to really test something. So your cycles were longer. Now we can release much more frequently and really test the software quicker. So that's less, I think that's a less of an issue, but going back to recruiting, if anybody wants to come, we're doing some cool things, right? Um, you know, so so I think that's that's kind of the the fun of it, and what's what's changed in the tech world a bit. Yeah, and how about you know one of the things we always always want to do with our guests too is kind of learn a little bit about your own career path. You know, obviously currently serving as EVP CIO Prudential, but we you know we looked you up on LinkedIn. Uh, you're, you you've definitely spent quite a bit of your career in the financial services, Finra. Um, insurance. I think that we bucket that all together yeah. industry. How did you get your start? What were you most fascinated in? And give us an idea of how you got your start down this path. Oh, wow. Um, I don't want to go that far back, but I, but I, but I joke because I came out of school and I wanted to be like a rocket science scientist. I thought I'd go to Grumman Aerospace and, you know, build the next F-14. Now, now I'm dating myself with Top Gun and everything, but, um, uh, you laugh, but I thought I was going to be an aerospace engineer, and it was the most uh, boring job. And that's probably <laughs> I, I wouldn't have guessed that. That like I wouldn't have guessed aerospace engineering is boring, but <laughs> uh, you know, for some people it wasn't, but it wasn't dynamic enough. And at least early on in my career, all I did was uh, fix code. Uh, right, I'd sit there, and if there was a bug, they'd send it my way, and I'd have to fix the code and. Put it in, but it was the way they worked. It wasn't dynamic. It wasn't exciting. We did a lot of government contracts, and I shouldn't say anything bad about 
Grove and Aerospace because they gave me my first job, which was great. Right. But I left pretty quickly because I knew it wasn't for me. But of course, I thought I was then going to go become an actuary. And then a very, you know, good friend and recruiter uh, said to me, Stacy, you're, you're not going to be happy there. Come with me. And he took me down to Solomon Brothers. And uh, I was hooked. I didn't even know what a debt or an equity product was, but walking out on the trading floor, seeing the environment, the dynamic nature of the business, I was hooked. And I've stayed in financial services uh, since. So, um, and I've worked technology on the business side. You know, I've enjoyed the mix, but it's always been in in the tech field. You know, applying yeah. technology. Yeah, now that's awesome. I can see that because I remember being a well, so I'll date myself too. It's okay. But when, when I saw, when I remember when I, as a kid, when I first saw like the scenes from Wall Street, it just seemed like this at a pace that yeah. was like relentless. Like this pace is like, you know, the way they always depicted in movies. I don't know if that was actually like that in, on the trading floor, but it was always like people are yelling stuff and trying to close deals and blah, 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 blah. obviously that's how it's depicted. Now, when you see, you know, like my kids, they've seen um, when they show like a, uh, on CNBC or something like that, and they show the trading floor, it looks just quiet. Like just people looking at computers. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's different because you're right. You're right. Uh, uh, probably um, trying to think timing, but not that long ago, you know, everything has been automated. So a lot of stuff is done electronically and algorithmically. So it's very different than, you know, when you step to yell and have an out, pure outcry system on the floor, or if you were on a trading desk, you know, there's a lot more that's done digitally today. Uh, so it is different. And um, I guess I picked the right field because it's all tech driven. There you go. Stacy. I want to say it's been awesome having you on the show and sharing some of the things that you guys are up to at Prudential and some of the methods that you're using to modernize and meet the customer and elevate the experience. But before you go, it is time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Stacy, this is where we ask you questions outside of the world of work oh, so no. that our audience can get to know you a little bit better. You ready? Uh-oh. Yes, I guess so. All right. You've mentioned that you're a golf fan. Yes. Tell me the best score you've had on, a, on, a, on any given round. 78. That's a good score. Yeah, that's a good score. That's a dang Here's good a, score. I'm not as good anymore. <laughs> How long have you been playing golf? Not that long. How did you pick it up? I don't know. You know, um, my father put a golf club in my hand when I was young. And I used to hit some balls now and then just to kill time when I was waiting for him. But I really got the itch when I got older and thought that it would be a great opportunity to kind of meet some people when I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. And that's about, um, oh, maybe 15 years ago. And, uh, and I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I started picking up a club and I got addicted. Uh, it's very addicting sport. And yeah. that's hard to believe because you're trying to hit this tiny ball and it's frustrating, but you hit one good hit and it's, it brings you back again. So I've met multiple golfers and I always say, that they, you know, they always say it's addicting and fun. And I was like, but every time I've seen you play, you look miserable. <laughs> most, <laughs> most people are cursing themselves like, oh, uh, <laughs> you know it's it's one of those sports that you really want to master uh, but you can't especially if you work uh and even if you don't work you know the pros make it look so easy but they play all the time every day and they've played for years and years and so it, it's it's a sport you never master it's that it's that great round that you have it's that fun time you have with some friends or family. It's just a great feeling. And you're outdoors. I work in an office. So, you know, spending four hours outdoors on a weekend is fantastic. There you go. Besides golf, what do you like to do for fun? Um, golf. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have my family. I like spending time uh, with my family. I like to travel a little bit, although that's not happening these days. Um, and I love my job. So um, that's probably where I spend most of my time. So along the way, uh, we often meet mentors that help guide us down the path. Who are some of the more influential people in your life that have helped you? Oh, um, I mentioned my father. My father really helped me in an, in an odd way. Um, uh, he taught me the value of a lot of things. 
even though I probably rebelled against it when I was younger, but he really taught me a lot of good stuff. And, um, you know, I think perseverance is one, um, you know, that people would say for me, I'm pretty, pretty uh, resilient and I drive and that's, and my father. That is awesome. And, you know, for yourself, when you think of, are you, are you a, uh, are you a tech person? Are you a gizmo person? Yes. All right. Tell us a recent piece of technology or gizmo that you've encountered that you think is going to be influential or like groundbreaking in, in maybe just it doesn't have to be groundbreaking to everybody, just groundbreaking for you. Like you just really excited about. Um, I have to think about that. Um, but you know, again, I, the, I don't do a lot on the weekends. I spend time with my family and travel, but I think it's some of the apps that are coming out for, um, for golf in particular, like on my watch, like just, you know, the, the, this little Apple watch can, you know, do things like tell me how far I hit the ball. It can tell me the distance. Uh, it talks to me. Uh, it's pretty cool what they're doing in a very inexpensive, simple app. Um, how it can it so much improve my experience uh, for the game, right? Uh, that's, that's, that to me is a pretty cool thing. Like those little, tra- I take the, the portable track man, you know, they're, they run on your phone. You have a little device. Uh, and that's pretty cool stuff that's come out. That makes, that makes like some of the sport more affordable for a lot of people to learn and have a similar experience that you just have to pay like 10 bucks for an app or, or buy a device that would normally cost like 25,000. Even they're much more affordable. That is awesome. Comes to mind. I'm very golf oriented. If you haven't noticed, listen, I'm very certain. We we mentioned it before the show started. I'm like that too. I have like a, only a handful of hobbies. I spend all my energy. If I get to choose what I'm going to do, I'm going to choose that. So I can totally respect it. And I mean, I can see it like getting away, being outside, shooting golf. Like it sounds fun. I mean, like I said, the only golf experience I've had is top golf, which you have also agreed is extremely fun. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. But I also do some stuff, you know, um, that are near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, I'm, I, I feel very strongly about, uh, you know, food insecurity in America and so, you know, I recently joined the, the board of the Community Food Bank in New Jersey. That's awesome. Um, you know, food insecurity is crazy in this country. Uh, it's, it's uh, the numbers are staggering if I were to share them with you. So doing stuff like that as well. So I kid about like, I, I, I golf, I spend time with my family, but I also think, um, you know, one of my passions as, as my career progresses is to do things around food insecurity and also education, because I think uh, that kids do it. So we do a lot of stuff uh, with Prudential as well. Another great thing about the company, we're very committed to the community. And so we do some things around uh, tech as well. Yeah, uh, those are very noble causes. I understand completely where you're coming from. My my children go to a school where a decent percentage of the students are on the free, free, free meal program, free lunch program, which means their family's income is under a certain... Um, you know, income line. And, uh, it was, it was pretty sad when COVID happened, like to describe what the problem you're talking about, which is like these kids actually depended on school to feed them. Yeah. I mean, the numbers are starting. It's like 38 million Americans food insecurity. It could be just not enough to eat or not the right foods to eat. Um, so I think it's really important. I I know we're having fun today, but I also want to mention, you know, there are things we, we should do as well, uh, to, to help, to help our community. There you go. And if someone's interested in hearing this and they care about this cause as well, can you can you go ahead and plug the nonprofit that you're a part of? Yeah, the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. You can Google them and you can get their their site. They're the largest food bank in the state of New Jersey, and uh, they're they're doing a fantastic job. And their goal isn't just to provide uh, food. Uh, their goal is to to help people, you know, get back on their feet so that they can get, you know, food, you know, fend for themselves. So they're doing some pretty cool things. Um, so I highly recommend people look in the mop and see what they're doing. You can volunteer, donate. Pretty cool. It's a pretty cool place. No, there you go. I love it. So for those that want the exact site is cfbnj.org. That's cfbnj.org. Stacy, I'm going to say thank you for sharing so much about what Prudential's up to. 
how you guys are modernizing the employee, the not just the employee experience, but also the customer experience. Thanks for sharing a little bit about your, you know, your how your father mentored you, your love of golf, and of course the nonprofit that you are currently a part of. Stacey, I want to thank you again for joining us today on IT Visionaries. Well, I have to say that episode holds up. The reality of the fins industry is that its customers just really don't like to change and they stick around for a long time. So ensuring that the services are the most useful, most friendly, and most accommodating is a must. Be sure to check out our next episode dropping Thursday for a very special rebroadcast of our conversation with Jim Fowler, CIO of Nationwide. He shared wisdom about doing all the jobs that nobody wants as a way to accelerate your personal growth, among many other fun topics. If you want more insightful Fins conversations, we have a brand new YouTube playlist with our very best Fins episodes. So check that out and happy Fins week to all who celebrate you.